All right. Well, welcome everybody to this is now the fourth in a uh, Housing Forward Massachusetts series of candidate conversations with the outstanding folks running to be mayor of Boston. I'm Josh Zakem, the executive director of Housing Forward Mass. I'm thrilled to be here with a friend and former colleague on the city council, uh, city council at large, Michelle Wu, who is uh, running for mayor of Boston. Michelle, thank you for joining us today. Really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Great to see you. Miss you as my seatmate on the council. That's right. I was sitting alphabetically. We were next to each other for, for quite some time. Um, just quickly to, to introduce and, and set the stage for this, I um, want to talk a little bit about what Housing Forward has been working on and the sort of basis for these conversations. And I want to start off by thanking our team, uh, Kendall Feynman, uh, our board over at Housing Forward, as well as community partners. Uh, like Abundant Housing Massachusetts, uh, the Great Neighborhoods Network, and others who have helped us spread the word, who have sent in questions uh, about this series. And I encourage everyone, if you haven't had a chance to look at the prior conversations with the candidates that are up on our Facebook page or at housingforwardma.org. So to get right into it, to set the stage here, Counselor, um, Housing Forward produced a mayoral of housing blueprint for Boston's next mayor. Um, laying out a series of sort of policy ideas that the mayor can do uh, without legislative change. You know, we're trying to do simple, small stuff, the type of things that mostly could happen in the first hundred days uh, or the first year uh, of a mayoral administration. And I want to talk a little bit about those and sort of how we came to that is, as everyone knows, every poll has said, you've talked about it. Um, there is a housing shortage. There is an affordability crisis in the city of Boston, really across the Commonwealth, but we'll keep it to Boston uh, for today. You know, recent report under the prior administration showed that by 2030, we need nearly 70,000 new housing units just to meet sort of the current demand. Um, we expect the city of Boston's population to grow to nearly six, 760,000 people by 2030. And while I'm thrilled that everyone wants to come and live here in the city of Boston, we need to make sure we're building an Enough housing supply, not only for the new folks who are coming here and we welcome them, but for people who have lived here their whole lives, uh, who have raised their families here and have built our neighborhoods. So along those lines, you know, we've talked about solutions like upzoning, you know, reducing parking minimums. Uh, first time home buying assistance is obviously a topic that comes up a lot to allow people to put down roots, build wealth in our community. Expedited permitting for small and medium sized projects, particularly affordable projects. You know, dedicated staff, whether that's at the ZBA or the BPDA or another agency, um, things like that um, that are out there that, again, are squarely within the orbit um, and the power of the mayor to do. Um, would also love to hear, and I'll come back to these so you don't need to answer everything at once, you know, your thoughts on appointees to the regulatory boards, the ZBA, the BPDA, the Zoning Commission, who have such an impact on this and who can make the changes we're talking about to ease the production uh, of all types of housing to meet the necessary demand. So with that long introduction, Councillor, um, we'd love to hear some of your thoughts on what I've said and, and definitely feel free to tell us a little bit about your own background um, and what you're thinking of when it comes to housing in the city of Boston. Well, thanks again for having me and for having all of us. I know uh, with so many of us, it, it ends up being a lot of coordination and time on your part. Um, so thank you so much for your leadership, Josh. I've seen it firsthand up close for many years on the council uh, from sitting right next to you. And housing was always a, a big focus of yours and making sure that we could expand access to all. And um, now in this new role to make sure that that advocacy stretches state statewide is, is really incredible. Um, as I think some of you are on know, um, I'm now in my eighth year of serving on the Boston City Council, representing all of our city and all of our communities and neighborhoods as an at-large counselor. I'm someone who never thought I would be in politics and so uh, grew up never having met a politician, not coming with networks or, or skills or, or really exposure, uh, but through family challenges saw just how much government matters and what it means when our city government works, but especially when it doesn't work. Oftentimes that interaction with residents that manifests itself in terms of barriers before very important supports and services are entirely fixable. And we can, we can be proactive in Boston about connecting people to all the opportunities and resources that are here. In my family's life, the challenges have been focused on 
the family situation that we've been in. My mom has been living with serious mental illness for some time. And so I ended up raising my sisters here and now am uh, raising my two boys. I get to live in a two family home in Roslindale upstairs with my kids and husband and my mom's downstairs, much stabilized now with the amazing healthcare we've gotten in the city, but there's no other living situation that could have brought our family such stability, such, such a blessing to be able to be in this multi-generational support network. And so I know how much, how tiny of a window we had to get in there, how we had to scrape every penny to, to put that down payment down. And it wouldn't have been possible with how quickly housing prices were going up for us to be in Roslindale even a year later. That's how fast the, the curve was moving. And so we're on an urgent clock here. Uh, we've seen during the pandemic how housing is health, housing is fundamental and is the, is, is the foundation for every other policy issue we're talking about. And so I'm eager to make sure we're digging in. Um, we've put forward a, a housing plan that includes many of the pieces that you talked about, Josh, about how we have the tools at the city level to take responsibility for the market and housing costs, to do more with city dollars, to streamline city processes, to really make sure we're expediting pieces within the rules and the zoning code that we can control. And then also, as I've put forward, to ensure that not only are we doing our best to increase supply as quickly as possible, but managing displacement in the short term too. And so I've put forward uh, a commitment to ensuring that we are thinking about stabilization as we are thinking about supply and all the other tools that we have. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. So let's dig in a, a little deeper on, on some of those things. Um, so you're talking about, you know, increasing supply, which is really what we're, we're trying to see. You know, we, we've heard the stories, um, I'm sure on the campaign trail, you've heard them. I heard them when I was in the city council of, you know, someone who's trying to build, you know, a triple decker um, or add a unit. You know, you said you live in a two family home um, and many of those are currently illegal, not illegal, but you need to get a variance to build them almost anywhere in the city. Um, is that something you would look at changing by zoning? Um, you know, some of our peer cities, particularly in the, the Northwest and Oregon and Minnesota have done that. They've said, you know, three families are allowed on any residential lot. Um, now, maybe that's not exactly what works for Boston, but what are your thoughts on, you know, up zoning, even in more of our um, suburban feeling neighborhoods? Uh, across the city? <clears throat> yeah, I, I, I've been saying for a number of years now, and in my capacity as chair of the Committee on Planning, Development and Transportation on the council, that a, a huge driver of inequities across the city is how our development process is run. And the fact that we are so focused case by case by case in a way where the zoning code is badly outdated, right? The entire code hasn't been updated in a comprehensive way since 1965. And that means that 95% plus of new developments are going through some extended process to secure exceptions to that zoning code, whether it's on a smaller scale through the Zoning Board of Appeals or on a larger scale, creating new spot zoning through the BPDA, the Boston Planning and Development Agency. And so, the big picture is that we need to update our zoning code to what makes sense for uh, affordability, transportation access, climate resiliency, but also how the city connects together across communities. And, and even now, when we have these extended processes, sometimes we get it right on an individual parcel, but the only way to get there is everyone coming into a very um, unnecessarily conflict-driven conversation because of the way the rules are, are so outdated. And then you look around and there's a mishmash because everything's been approved separately. Plus all the costs have gone into the soft costs of process and lawyers and managing that, that unforeseen timeline rather than keeping units affordable. And so uh, I point to the example of Oregon a lot in terms of thinking about the bucket of tools that um, at, at that, you know, at that level of states, but cities can also employ. And what they did was a mix of both moving away from single family zoning to dramatically increase density by right, but also capping the increase of the rate of increase of rents at 7% plus inflation, which has worked out to something like nine and a quarter percent um, on, on average per year. And so that way you are both, you know, and I appreciate abundant um, housing Massachusetts philosophy of we need to use every tool that's in the toolkit, both to push supply, but also to make sure our residents can stay here. But zoning is a very powerful piece of that that has to flow from planning 
and having a, a, a way to fit together all of our needs, not just density and um, height and FAR and what we typically think about as being as running through that development process, but also access to transportation and schools and, and food access, um, that should all happen through a, a much more robust planning infrastructure. Yeah, well, that's good. And I, I like that you called out the added costs that get passed on to the ultimate occupants uh, of this housing with this long drawn out process. And I think about, you know, we often think about the high profile, large projects and people in those positions, you know, are still often able to get something done, but the ones that are lost to the process, uh, you know, is sort of those small developers, people often who are from the community, who are, you know, building their own business, building in their own neighborhoods, get just uh, crushed by by some of these long timelines. So it's exciting to see that you're uh, open to that and, and looking at that as well. Um, so you, you did mention um, Oregon as an example, and uh, we've talked about in California and Minnesota and other places that are reducing required parking minimums. Um, you know, there's currently a proposal, two of your colleagues on the city council, uh, Councilors Bach and O'Malley, to uh, remove parking minimums for affordable developments. Have you had a chance to, to talk about that, to think about that? Um, so start with just affordable, but then I'd love to hear your, your views on, on parking minimums generally, because as we often have been saying, you are often choosing parking over housing, you know, whether it's the space, okay. the cost, that sort of thing. Yeah, I, I fully support that proposal. Um, sometimes I don't, I don't, I'm, it might've been this particular hearing order. I can't remember, but there was one in which I had to miss the council meeting for a, a, a loss in our family. Um, so it was away and didn't sign on. And I got a lot of questions. Why, why did you withhold your name? I just literally was not at the meeting, um, but have been part of the, the working sessions and conversations since then and really applaud their leadership for um, as you're saying, trying to find immediate actionable steps that we can take, even as we're contemplating bigger picture reforms. Um, you know, you remember, so, uh, we each get a parking spot in city hall as city councilors. Um, we have our kind of nameplate up there. And for a lot of my tenure on the council, I would have a bike parked in there instead of a car. It got a little harder once both kids were going to <laughs> city hall childcare with me. And I, I didn't feel safe with, with them um, coming all the way from Roslindale on a bike. But we need to think about how we, for our climate goals, for public health, for livability and, and connectivity across the city, that we make it possible for uh, more people to be able to leave behind cars. And so we, we can't just accept as a given that things will always be this way, because when we build that way, then we reinforce that. Um, at the same time, of course, you know, what we hear from communities often is that, well, you can't just operate in a vacuum where we're going to um, move this direction and then not make the, um, the, the, consequent investments in public transportation, right? So we have to do all of that at the same time, moving towards complete streets, moving towards a much healthier, stronger transportation infrastructure, which I believe the city can step into much, much larger of a role. And we've partnered on things like that before, um, but also recognizing that it makes a difference. It affects the, the balance sheets, it affects the uh, space and the, the interaction and design of, of buildings. And so where possible, we should be thinking about how we can unlock um, a different lifestyle for residents as well. Uh, what, what do you think in, in your view is the largest obstacle right now uh, that's constraining housing supply in the city of Austin? I think it's our process. I think it's um, the fact that we are really operating the most complex, opaque, political, development approvals process anywhere in the country. And, you know, when, when, when it's designed such that the only way to build anything is to come before city government and offer something, right? Sure, maybe you can justify it by saying, well, that kind of maximizes the civic benefit because you're able to extract something from every single project. But we get locked into this um, awful status quo where we are spending so much time, energy, financial resources on navigating the process instead of just creating the actual units that we, we need desperately. And so that's why I've been pushing for uh, years now, really rethinking how we do that process and how we can reconfigure the organizational structure of our agencies, as well as how we are giving out those approvals so that we're getting to the point where there's an updated zoning code 
more streamlined process um, of you know likely some higher uh, requirements just baked in but most of the time when i speak with developers people say tell me what the rules are and make it clear for me to do it and i will um as opposed to not having any rules and then playing this game of you know can you get through the gauntlet it's frustrating for residents it's frustrating for developers and it leads to um, the city of boston falling short on so many of our goals so it actually folds in nicely and i'm not surprised to have some questions about your proposal to eliminate the bpda so we've got some questions that have just been coming in the last couple minutes um here's the first one on the topic it's pretty clear it says can you elaborate on how your position on abolishing the bpda or heavily reorganizing it, whatever form that takes, would help accelerate the construction of the needed middle income and affordable housing in the city of Boston. We need master planning in the city. Right now, to the extent that there is planning, it, it either happens on a sort of large project scale with the developers um, moving forward and, and being asked to facilitate much of that, or it happens in small corridors or pieces here and there, but then the end result of all of those meetings and years of process is that there's just guidelines. There's not even clear parameters or codification of those rules. And so I believe that the only way to kind of escape this broken cycle that we are in is to really look at organizational change, to have a separate planning agency that is independent, accountable to the city in a different way than our development sort of mega agency currently is. We are unique in our city relative to every other major city, relative to most cities in Massachusetts. And that has played out in how the process has been administered over the last 60 or so years. And so it is time to get to the point where we are planning, true planning that engages the community and really talks through the trade-offs that are needed as we make decisions about development, open space, housing, what's feasible for the market and affordable for residents. And then also supplementing that with city resources, right? We just need to have more skin in the game when it comes to the city looking at municipally owned parcels of land, buildings, integrating the redevelopment of libraries, municipal parking lots, community centers um, with housing on top, ideally homeownership units that are affordable and, and climate resilient. Um, there's a lot of potential there. I mean, much of our municipal footprint should be looked at through that lens and we haven't done a full analysis of uh, what would be possible for our housing supply relative to that. So on that front, you talk about the planning or the fact that we have planning, but it doesn't get codified. So I and mean, that's a common theme. We've heard that folks have asked in other sessions, um, you know, are there current plans that you would work to codify into zoning that have been done and that are currently guidelines, or would you be looking to do a real plan, a full planning process in the city neighborhood? By, I mean, it's a huge task. I mean, even if even if you're mayor for you know 20 years, like so like Don Menino, maybe you don't get all the way through it. How do we how do we do this? Obviously, good planning and good zoning, but how do we also get it done? Because you know you can't put we can't put construction on hold for five years in the city while while we try to do that. Yeah, that was exactly, I was going to add another wrinkle, which is that not only how do we get it done at, at, you know, what will be a substantial scale, but how do we ensure that there's predictability in this, in the transition period as well in, in the short term. Um, and so a, a couple of things. One is that, you know, we have models from around us. Somerville just went through a citywide, you know, obviously smaller scale, but uh, went through a major planning and then rezoning process over the course of about two years. Um, and in fact, both Mayor Walsh and Mayor Menino um, undertook a major citywide process, um, both in fact aiming to the year 2030, which, which was interesting. We all, we, most of us have heard of the Imagine Boston 2030 process and the subsequent sort of document that was produced, which you know, could have been pushed a little further into zoning and, and an actual plan. But in fact, um, Mayor Menino early on had launched what he what was called Boston 400, um, even back then planning to the year 2030, but which would be the city's 400th anniversary. And so we've gone through the exercise before of setting up the kind of civic conversations and infrastructure. Um, there are a couple of different ways to do it if, if we are sure that we're going to move towards codifying this. One could be to divide the city up into different regions, right? Because and to potentially move at different timescales and with a different focus area along the coast, 
really thinking about climate resiliency and the major challenges of flooding and, and climate impacts around Franklin Park. How do we ensure that we are really investing in and connecting the amazing resource we have in this historic park as the centerpiece to uh, sort of the heart of the city. And then thinking about transportation access and opportunities for development in other, other regions of the city where there, um, there's more need for investment and, and the potential to really create spaces that are um, affordable to residents at, at, at accessible levels. And so if you think about different regions and you know doing what we've already done in some ways, but just making sure we're then actually going through the process of saying, now we're gonna remove the politics from it. Because the difference between having guidelines and having an updated zoning code is that elected officials and especially the mayor continue to be able to weigh in when it's just guidelines and say, well, actually I still need you to do this or I still need you to jump through this or that. Um, and it can feel scary, both for the city and for residents who will not be able to then weigh in on every single project happening. But we have to have faith and we have to work together as a city to earn the trust of residents that our robust planning process will incorporate community needs and balance the holistic trade-offs that are required so that we can actually have even greater access, housing stability and um, actually see development providing the resources to close the gaps that are that are that's capable of. Thank you. So we have two questions that are similar and that sort of fold into that. So the one is it says, you know, what is your strategy to balance the critical need for more production of housing, especially affordable, but also with the need to, as you talked about, neighborhood input, um, where there's often opposition uh, to any new cons construction, new buildings. Um, and then another question I'm just going to let you chew on that for a second. Um, another one I was scrolling down specifically is citing the B, the recent BU study that demonstrated, you know, around Massachusetts that the folks who are at community meetings uh, are overwhelmingly older, uh, white are usually homeowners um, who are opposing these things. You know, how how do you balance those needs? You know, well, community. Yeah, no, I and I I I have the I've read the Neighborhood Defenders book. I think it's great and and very important for us to keep in mind, not just for development processes, but for how we set up engagement with residents on, on any number of policy areas. Who are we truly bringing to the table and who are we who are we asking uh, for feedback from versus meeting people where they're at? I think, again, the key is that sometimes we think about, um, you know, call, whether you call it nimbyism or whether you call it um, sort of local opposition, we think about that as a given. And then there's this sense of, well, we're, we need to find ways to just overcome that. But I would say that, in fact, it is the system right now that is producing so much opposition because there's no other way for community members to have meaningful feedback at all. And so if we actually had a planning process to update our zoning code, we would not be having individual meetings on every single project after that to weigh the details and, and what is feasible or not because the code would represent what is allowed in Boston and the exceptions that go through the ZBA would truly be exceptions. I, and it feels hard to conceive of given where we are now, but um, this is really much closer to the system in many cities across the country. Um, and I think the other point I wanna just emphasize is that we are in a, a, a moment of great transition right now. We're in a moment of economic uncertainty and cycles in the real estate market are much more compressed now than say, you know, a decade ago where you'd have an upswing and then a longer depression, a recession, depression, et cetera. Now it's, it's kind of because the flow of capital around the world is so fluid the response time is just the windows are much shorter for action. And so as we're thinking about what the impacts to our downtown commercial office market might be, as more people are tuning in remotely, down big companies downsizing their office space, we will see vacancies. And it hasn't quite affected the leases yet because people are still locked in for now. But I believe we will see an impact from many of our employers downsizing how much space they need. And the question is, when we have these vacancies, are we really proactive with leadership and a vision from city government to say, can we repurpose some of this, you know, in the dream scenario as housing? And I know it's expensive to retrofit commercial buildings as residential, all the plumbing and this, I've had many conversations with developers, 
but think about it potentially for student housing where there might be a little bit less need for individual bathrooms or at, at the at the you know at the very least or at a minimum think about it as, as an opportunity to get on-site child care in so many of our downtown office buildings so that we can change the um, incentives for people to come back to work in person every city across the country is wrestling with how we stay relevant right now as people can move anywhere people can choose to leave behind high cost of living metro areas to live somewhere with much more space and more cost effectively and still zoom into their work. We need to be that city that leans in right now to think of this as an opportunity and how we really strengthen the, the bones that Boston has with arts, culture, restaurants, just walkability, so much reason to be here in person, but how does that translate into our uh, real estate market and the actions that city government could be taking right now to lean in and make sure we're setting that foundation. Thank you. So next question from the audience um, on rent control. Um, you know, there's been a lot of coverage that you're the only person running for mayor uh, who is an advocate for the return of rent control to Massachusetts. So the question is, you know, how do you do that without preventing damage to small landlords and to the housing production that we're talking about that we need to if we need to build more, you know, how, how do you how do you manage that? Yeah. So um, a couple things. One is that I have read every academic paper and all the research on rent control and on all different sides. And I think sometimes we're talking about different problems to be solved. And it's clear that rent regulation, rent control, rent stabilization um, doesn't produce more affordable housing. In fact, over the long term, it's been established that it actually makes that more difficult. But what it has been documented to do and what is also very needed in this moment is to provide temporary emergency relief to residents who otherwise would be displaced. And we are seeing a displacement crisis in Boston at the evictions moratorium being lifted now. We are seeing families pushed out of the city. And so this is about addressing one short-term, very major crisis that we have while we're in the process of building supply and doing everything we can to ensure that we are transitioning to having a different uh, market and, and different options available for, for residents. But if all we are doing is waiting and trying to change the zoning code and building more aff affordable units in the time period that it takes to get these new buildings up and, and on them online, uh, we will lose hundreds, thousands of families in the process who, who will never be able to come back to Boston. And, and so um, this is about city government having every tool in our toolkit ready and able to deploy in a mix of um, protections that can ensure that we're not only able to welcome new residents to Boston, but to maintain our, our community as being diverse, racially and ethnically across income spectrums, across different perspectives. And um, that is at risk right now if, if we don't stop, if we don't address displacement in some way. So would you envision any sort of rent control or stabilization as a temporary measure? Um, or is that something that would, would be uh, in perpetuity? So I think, you know, with any policy dis discussion, we need to have full, public conversations with stakeholders at the table representing all different viewpoints. Oftentimes when there are, you know, okay, let me say one thing, which is that I am not advocating for, and I don't think many are advocating for a straight return to uh, sort of 1970s style rent control. We're talking about using a mix of tools and particularly with the focus on rent stabilization that would address the transition as we're boosting housing supply. And that's not something that happens with a stroke of the pen from, from the, the new mayor. Uh, we need to advocate for state legislative approval for cities even to be able to have that public um, discussion, that legislative conversation. And I would be pushing for Boston to be able to deploy this in a style that um, includes much targeted, specific and intentional use of this. Um, there are cities across the country that have created displacement risk indices so looking at census tract by census tract, what is the rate of um, increase in housing costs, the proportion of homeowners versus renters, um, median income for that area, just to really know where along the spectrum in terms of risk of displacement 
specific communities are, not even at the neighborhood level, but micro neighborhood level. And to be able to respond to our plans with our new planning agency and zoning code to address the fact that when we do introduce new development, we wanna make sure that that is stabilizing the community and not um, exacerbating displacement. So something along the lines of the affirmatively furthering fair housing um, zoning amendment that's uh, that's recently been enacted, um, so sort of narrowly targeted that sort of that sort of approach. Yeah, that is that's the initial goal. I think you know we often have seen in the past that when there are policies like this rolled out, there's different um, categories there or different treatment for smaller landlords. Uh, versus large buildings. So, you know, this is a this is a wide range of nuance in what a policy could look like. I am arguing forcefully for the city of Boston as within our municipal authority to have the power to have these conversations and to move quickly on taking every possible step. So uh, along those lines, we mentioned the, the eviction moratorium. Um, obviously, President Biden announced yesterday that they're seeking to extend it for, it was 60 days. Um, there's some concerns about, you know, Supreme Court, especially this Supreme Court, allowing that it's already being challenged in several areas. What can the city of Boston sh- can do now or should be doing both now and after November um, to do that? Assuming there's no longer a federal eviction moratorium, um, is there staffing, are there resources, are rental assistance? Where where would you focus those efforts? Um, it doesn't have to be one area, but ha- how will you address that in in, in the near term? Yeah, I think my theme for so much of how I see policy is let's make sure that city government is really doing everything we can at the local level and not waiting on other levels of government for action or for for help. Um, We know that the state's eviction moratorium um, for those seeking rental assistance is still in place and that there is substantial resources. There are substantial resources for assistance and stabilization that are going untapped right now. And I think at the city level, our unique um, value add is often in outreach and trying to actually connect people face-to-face and in community with the services and resources that are available. And so we need to be focusing very intensely on multilingual outreach and working with community partners who are already embedded on the ground to ensure that the resources that are there are not going unused in this moment of great need. Yeah, that's that makes a lot of sense. Getting getting the money and, and getting the assistance to people who need it is always a huge challenge. I think at all levels of government, um, a lot of the folks who need it most don't aren't aware of the services right. that already exist, either because of language barriers or, or other reasons. So I uh, commend you for for that approach and obviously your work on language access um, you know, from day one in City Hall. I think goes a long way towards that. Um, here's a question uh, that just popped in. So the the the. Uh, audience member, the questioner says, I, I support a lot of your ideas like a free tea, uh, rent stabilization, but a lot of those, well, those in particular require approval from the state. Um, can you talk a little bit about, I'm, I'm now adding to the to the question, yeah. but can you talk a little bit about how you would use the bully pulpit as mayor, both to advocate and prioritize, because you don't get everything uh, up at the state house. And then what is along the, what in those areas is directly in the mayor's power? You know, how would you take smaller steps uh, on those Absolutely. that the mayor could do without a home rule petition? Yeah. So, well, you, you don't get everything, but you don't get anything if you don't make the ask and engage. And so I think first is really leaning into representing Bostonians needs, even when it is technically outside of, of city control. I think there are instances where... <laughs> I'm interrupting. Thank you so much. Um, There are instances where we know that um, when the mayor of Boston steps up, it makes a difference. And we've seen that on transportation and on housing, where several years ago, when we first started talking about fare free transportation, there was tremendous skepticism. How would you even begin to take any steps? The T is so far behind in deferred maintenance and has so many needs. And all of that is true. But what I really believe is that we have to be reaching for the vision of where we're actually headed. Otherwise, we won't take steps that get us much progress at all. And in in shifting what we're aiming for higher than just saying, well, we should only have as small fare increases as possible every couple of years to we should be aiming for a free 
fully funded public transportation system. That has meant that in the short term, we've seen the launch of Boston's first free bus route and free public transportation in cities across Massachusetts because of the advocacy here. Um, a lot depends on the relationship between the mayor of Boston, the governor, the state legislature, the city council, and between municipalities across the region as well. And if there's anything that I know, um, it's that the barriers in Boston are never around resources. It's about political will, which comes from building coalitions. And so I'm proud that um, we've gotten so much done on the council, sometimes impossible things that people said would be impossible to do because the mix of continuing to bring people into the conversation, sometimes to, to challenge and to push us to think outside the box, but then to constantly illuminate and, and aim for what is possible makes it such that we take different steps in the short term. And on those issues, you know, we need resources, we need state partnership, but when the mayor of Boston really believes that more is possible, we will find a way to build those coalitions to get it done. Thank you. I'm going to go right back to some nuts and bolts uh, questions on, on housing uh, and development. Uh, density bonuses for, you know, some level of affordability. How do you feel about that? And are there any numbers um, that, that you've thought about, you know, a percentage of affordability gets you, you know, X many more square feet or FAR, that sort of thing, um, assuming you're okay with density bonuses. I, yeah, I support that. Um, I, I'm, I'm proud that, you know, remember when we were first, um, Starting on the council early on, there was around that time the launch of the city's housing innovation lab, and so some of the first conversations that that uh, part of that agency had, I was proud to help co-lead and talk about a whole list of ideas, including formalizing AD, um, accessory dwelling units, density bonuses, really the kind of low hanging fruit of how we could move forward and expedite and think about filling in some of the gaps for housing supply. Um, in terms of specific numbers, I think, you know, we need a new planning agency to help us think through how in different parts of the city that needs to respond to the conditions on the ground um, and would look forward to ensuring that we have various stakeholders at the tables we're having those conversations. And you, so you mentioned just now accessory dwelling units. Um, that's the city's had a pilot, um, not super extensive. Um, how do you feel about that, both attached, you know, in the basement attic spaces or detached in some of our neighborhoods that people actually have yards in? Um, you know, yes, what are your thoughts on that? both and uh, was proud to help push to get us even to where we are now in terms of formalizing it. Excellent, because I, I do think that's something that, you know, again, when we, and I've said this in some of our other um, candid conversations is, you know, the solutions that Housing Forward is trying to push forward push forward, uh, no, no pun intended there, um, is around, you know, small stuff that when it adds up makes a big difference on supply. So accessory dwelling units, you know, maybe you get a few hundred uh, across the city, you know, density bonuses, uh, legalizing triple deckers everywhere. Again, it, it all adds up and to get us to that 69,000 new unit number by 2030. And I think a lot of it gets lost, um, you know, in the conversation around a specific project or big ideas like, you know, reorganizing or abolishing the BPDA. Um, and I, it's encouraging uh, that you've addressed these and you've done some work on these um, already, um, you know, from the city council position. I think that was in some ways that was the, the goal of our big push with Airbnb as well and short term rentals is that there were some, you know, it, it was something like three, 4,000 units that we were aiming to reclaim from short-term rentals, sort of de facto hotel use in residential neighborhoods to long-term um, rentals for, for tenants living in community. And it sounded small, right, at the, at the time, a couple thousand units across the city. But if you looked at housing production year by year, you know, what we're permitting that, I mean, the equivalent of a year's worth of, of permitting of new units, um, being able to come back through through reasonable regulations is something that, you know, we, we just need to be thinking about every angle and doing all we can in this moment. Housing is really central. It should be the foundation to our recovery. So I'm going to ask a question. One last question right now is day one, your mayor, what are you going to do on housing? What is your first priority when it comes to housing? Uh, again, something that you can do with the stroke of a pen. So um, I have made a couple of commitments when it comes, well, the very, very first thing I think is 
to make sure to put up on the wall the countdown. Uh, and this is something that that we had when I was uh, working for Mayor Menino under Mitch Weiss, is just to have a sense of how precious these days are in public service where we need to be moving at the pace of people, families' lives and not the usual pace of government. And so much as possible if every single day you have to show forward movement and some progress. Um, I've, you know, on, on one piece of this, you know, we talk a lot of, on the campaign trail, especially about homelessness in Boston and the overlap of homelessness, mental health and substance use. And so the very first commitment I've made is that within the first hundred days, we will do an analysis of city owned property to identify where there might be underutilized buildings or uh, parcels of land to really add to our supply and particularly to think about supportive housing. Great. Well, thank you. That's a good, good, quick, uh, quick answer on that. I appreciate it. Um, I want to just say I appreciate your time uh, and your attention on this. And I know I tell folks we'll be out of here uh, in about 45 minutes. I think we're going to make that, uh, even though we got a lot in. Um, really appreciate you sharing your thoughts on this. Um, I'm going to give you uh, a few minutes uh, if you want to, you know, anything you'd like to add on housing or generally about the campaign uh, before closing us out, Counselor. Yeah, no, thank you so much, Josh. And thank you to everyone who had a hand in organizing and uh, being part of this. We are 40 days to go now until the preliminary election. So things are really uh, speeding up and, and heating up. And I, of course, want to very respectfully ask for your vote uh, for anyone who is watching, because we know, sadly, that turnout in municipal races tends to be relatively low. We're going to we're going to change that trend as well. But it means that every person's voice counts that much more. And um, this will be a consequential decision for our city. I'm someone who didn't have the privilege or, or pleasure of growing up in Boston. My parents weren't lucky enough to be born in the United States. And so I know how important it is to, to build a welcoming city where people from all over, whether you've grown up here and are sixth generation in Boston, or you're coming here for school, or you're new to this country and finding making your home in the city, Boston needs to live up to our potential and our promise that we are a city that welcomes everyone. Uh, we know over the course of our history that when Boston leads, we impact the entire country. Um, and so I'm looking forward to partnering with you all and making sure that housing is a, a place where we are changing the dynamic away from stress and anxiety for so many of our families and fear of making awful trade-offs and choices to a, a sense of pride and community and belonging, welcoming in our city. So um, thanks for all that you do. Uh, please remember to vote and um, make sure that you're telling your friends how important this is. Mind everyone the date of the preliminary? September 14th. There you go. Okay, well, uh, thank you very much, uh, Councillor Wu, for being here um, and for your service to the city of Boston. Uh, as we're wrapping up, I want to remind everyone we have the last uh, in our series of candid conversations with former Chief of Economic Development John Barros in this spot uh, tomorrow at noon, also on Facebook Live. Um, please feel free to follow us on Twitter, on Facebook um, for these resources, for our mayoral blueprint on housing and for the prior conversations. Really appreciate everyone's attention, taking the time, the great questions, thoughtful questions. Um, have a great afternoon. We'll see you around the city. Thanks again, Michelle. Thanks everyone.